One of the things that is a really interesting problem is just why Zen has become so fascinating to many people in the West. Because as you find Zen in Japan today, it's a pretty tough scene. There are very few Japanese interested in it. The monastery of Myoshinji in Kyoto was built to accommodate 600 monks. There are now 30. For example, I wanted to have a conversation with a learned priest of the Shingon sect and uh, I had two interpreters, his wife, who speaks very good English, and the interpreter we had for our group. And as we got into things, they started to say, sorry, but this is impossible to translate into English. We, we don't know what it means. So I said, all right, let's get some paper. And when any word arose that they didn't understand, I had him write it in Chinese characters, which I can more or less read. And so we managed to con converse in this very strange roundabout way of the syntax being conveyed by the interpreters and the actual terms uh, being written. But that shows you, you see, that the quite intelligent people, but the interpreter was a very intelligent man, and the priest's wife, a very well-educated woman. But they don't know what it's all about. So how come, then, you see, this fascination in the West? Well, uh, it's due very largely to the way in which certain people have presented Zen to the West, notably Suzuki, and R. H. Blythe. They have made a great use of the Zen story or the anecdotes. There is a book of Zen anecdotes, these conversations between the masters and their students. They're called Mondo or Question Answer. There is a book which uh, is called the Mumon Khan. And it's a, just a collection of, of stories. And I remember a friend of mine in England, when this was first in circulation, getting this book when he was in hospital. And he said, I don't understand it at all, but it's cheered me up immensely. So the typical sort of Zen story, uh, where a student asks the teacher a question, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism? And the master says, wait around until there's no one here and I'll tell you. So later the student says to him, now there's nobody around, master, what is it? And he takes him out into the garden and he points at the bamboos. And the student says, I don't understand. The master says, what a long bamboo that one is. What a short one that one is. Period. It has a kind of a shaggy dog feeling. It has a, uh, it just leaves you wondering, well, what's this meant to convey? And the answer, of course, is that Suzuki explains most carefully. It's not a symbolical tale. In other words, you're not supposed to understand that bamboos symbolize something uh, in, in the way that, for example, the parables in the New Testament are symbolical tales. It's not like that at all. All these Zen Mondo are absolutely clear. There is no concealed symbolism except in very rare incidents. And then the symbolic element is subordinate. Always the answer is completely straight. For example, there is a famous koan where the answer to the question, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism, is the second son of the Sho family and the third son of the Ko family. 
something like that. And uh, once a student uh, gave an answer to this koan, and the teacher accepted it, but the teacher's chief student, who was standing by at the time, said when the other student had gone away, he said, I think you should test him on this. And uh, I don't think he really understands. So he called him back the next day and said, uh, gave him this koan again, and he gave the same answer as he gave before. And the teacher said, no, no, that won't do at all. But he said, Master, you accepted this answer yesterday. But the master replied, yesterday it was yes, but today it is no. When another, when we had a, a, a talk with uh, one of the great Roshis in Japan on our last visit, we were discussing the translation of Zen texts into English. And there's quite a work going on in that way. But he said, it's not necessary. If you understand Zen, you can use any book to teach it with. You could use the Bible. You could use Alice in Wonderland. After all, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. And this is a very, very straight story. See, this is saying exactly what it's about in the plainest language. Only people overlook it. You know, when something's right under your nose and you can't see it, and you go looking over there, 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 and you're carrying it, you see, it's like that. And so uh, Suzuki has explained that that's the way it is. That uh, once when Saburo Hasegawa, who was a great Japanese painter, was at a dinner party here in San Francisco. Somebody asked him, uh, what about understanding Zen? How long does it take? He said, it might take you 30 years. It might take you three minutes. I mean that. So you see the element of fascination? That it's right under your nose. You're looking right at it, you see? It's like uh, you, you do get sort of strangely puzzled when you've lost something. And somebody's kidding you. They're not pointing it out to you, but to say, why don't you see it? It's right there. And you can't for the life of you. It, I mean, it's far more interesting, that sort of situation, than something that's really difficult to find. I mean, where you'd have to go digging under the floors. I mean, if, someone, if, a, if a treasure were concealed in the walls of this ferry boat, you know, would have to go digging through the walls and looking with all sorts of things. But here is the treasure concealed in full view and concealed by being in full view, but in the place that's too obvious to look. So that's the flavor of Zen. And that's why it's become so fascinating. Also, there are other elements in it that uh, it has a humor to it, which is peculiarly Chinese. I don't think the Japanese have quite the humor in their Zen that the Chinese had. And you, because, you see, this humor comes from Taoism. The, the, say, the writings of Zhuangzi, who uh, was the great Taoist philosopher who lived shortly after 300 BC. He's the only really great humorous philosopher. And that flavor has passed on into Zen. And also, Zen is uh, something experiential. It, you're not required to believe in anything. It doesn't have any doctrines. It entirely consists in a state of consciousness. Awakened consciousness. So as if I were to say to you, you if you were puzzled about something, you know, you were what Tillich calls concerned about being. What is this thing, life? Why are we here? Why, why is it suffering? 
Why do all these creatures multiply in different ways and shapes? Why are the ducks? Why are the trees? Why are the snails, clams, people, all that? For heaven's sakes, why? And why do they come and go? And what happens to them when they go? We all want to know that. So that's the kind of concern. Now Zen answers this, not with an idea, but with a changed state of consciousness. And we, you never know whether you can get that changed state of consciousness instantly, right now, without further ado, or whether you have to work for it many long years. There was an American student of Zen who went to Japan on a Fulbright. And uh, he studied and studied. He practiced his meditations and uh, sat in the meditation posture with all the other monks. And the, of course, part of the technique is to work up a state of intense doubt, puzzling about what is it? You know, what's this? You know, what is it? What is existence? What is isness? Well, he worked and worked and worked at it. And uh, nothing happened. And the time for his stay was be very close to the end. And he couldn't get a renewal of the grant. And he had to go back to the United States. And he thought, this is uh, absolutely terrible. I won't get it. I won't get the satori, the awakened insight. So he went to the master and said, look, this is desperate. You've got to help me. And the master said, now, look, you, what you've got to do is now go into what's called session. Uh, session means uh, study of the mind, but it means prolonged meditation where you hardly even sleep. And he says, you really get to work on it, and you come and see me four times a day and see if you can answer your koan, and I'll help you. So he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he sat there, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> until almost the day he had to leave, when suddenly he saw that there was nothing to realize. And then he had it. You see, Zen works on this principle, and it's called using an empty fist to deceive a child. You know when you say now to a child, what have I got here? And the child is all interest, what is in there? and you hide your hand this way, that way, and so on, that the child is fantastically interested. And then finally, there's nothing. So in the same way, you can get a problem about life, which is a closed fist. What is it all about? It's like asking, what's the pit in the middle of an onion? and you take off all the skins and so on, so on, so on, and suddenly you find you've got a litter of skins and no pit. There wasn't anything in it. And you might say, well, that's, it's a hoax. It's a, the life is a deception, a tale told by an idiot. And yet, what you had missed in looking for the pit were the beautiful skins. See, that's the edible part of the onion. Whereas you may peel a potato, the onion is all skin, but excellent. Now, the, what, what one has done under these circumstances is you have missed the point by being too eager. You have therefore overlooked what was obvious. And so problems are made about the nature of the universe by asking the wrong questions. May I repeat that there are four great philosophical questions. And in a way they are all of them mistaken. But they are the questions that people have asked through all history about the world. One, who started it? Two, are we going to make it? Three, where are we going to put it? And four, who's going to clean up? Plato, Aristotle, Kant, 
uh, Descartes are all discussing these four questions. Now, you see, but the, if you begin at the beginning, who started it? That's a, a, a misleading question. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> it was always here. You know, it is what there is. And uh, you had it, man. <laughs> but if you, if you get onto that, you know, uh, what, what do you see? When there's some kind of shenanigans going on, the police come by. They want to know who started it. They're looking for a ringleader because they want someone to blame. Society requires that somebody should be blamed. So what we do is, we, the, from childhood, all human beings get together and they make up the idea that you started it. Only it's no fun if we know immediately who started it. It has to be sort of concealed. So people tell lies and uh, cover up and so on. And uh, so we want to know who's good guys and who are the bad guys. Really, there aren't any differences. We are all collectively doing what we are doing. And because one person is, as we know, say, a criminal, uh, it has to do with his parents and his environment and so on. But that mustn't be admitted. Because we wouldn't know how to deal with all of us. You see, if, if the thing that's, that, that's the matter with human beings is all human beings, in addition to their environment and the fishes and the birds and everything, it all goes together. It's absolutely interconnected. And, uh, but, so, but that's no fun, you see. So we, break, we pretend that it's all broken up into bits and that one starts it and so on. So once you've done that, once you've broken it all up into bits, and they start playing cops and robbers, then you have problems. And uh, it may be fun to have problems. It's perfectly all right to have problems. Because that's the, the, the interest of things. We make life interesting by making it difficult. And sometimes we overdo it. And then it gets desperate, and then people begin to ask, well, what's it all about? Why are we doing this? And then you have to go to a Zen master or somebody like that to be cured of your illusions. And the way he does it, you see, is to make you ask intensely, what is it? What is the sound of one hand? Listen. No, really listen. What is the sound of one hand? What is that? See, when somebody asks a Zen master, what is the fundamental meaning of Buddhism? He said, the cypress tree in the yard. All right, go out there and look at it. Or just the sound, mu. The great master Joshu was asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? And he said, no. Mu in Chinese. Well, everybody knows if they studied any Mahayana Buddhism that not only do dogs have in them Buddha nature, which means uh, the capacity to become a Buddha, an awakened one, or you could say it means Buddha nature could roughly mean the divine center. So why did the master say no? So they, what they do is this. They, they work on the word no. And sometimes the masters teach them to say no, really. Now he says, say no, shout it. And the student shouts. And the teacher says, uh-uh, you didn't really mean it. Try again. And so he, he gets to yelling no. You see, no, 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 you see. And the teacher says, no, this is not good enough. Get behind it, get with it. And the student gets so frustrated, he suddenly realizes he can't say no. Well, now, you know a little bit about this. Supposing you take the word no, and you say it many times. No, 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 no. And it becomes funny. You wonder... Isn't it strange that this funny sound, no, which makes you itch a little bit on the tip of your nose, uh, means no? Well, what does no mean? <laughs> what does it mean 
that you know what I mean when I say no. See, I mean no means I won't. <laughs> I don't want any dinner or something. Uh, I won't play with you. But take the situation of uh, a person making this exchange with another. See, we, we know the meaning of the word no, but what does it mean that we are able to have this exchange of meaning, this communication? Does that mean anything? Well, it, in a way it doesn't. You can come and sit over here, there's plenty of room. Yeah. Uh, what, what that is, you see, the fact that we as human beings communicate, that we say, how do you do in the morning and goodbye at night, that we eat, that we have children, and uh, they all put in little boxes, and they, uh, you know, become doctors and lawyers and business executives, and they do this and they do that. It's just like the trees grow up and they do this, and they wave in the wind, and the birds flap around and they eat things, and that makes bird, because all the food you eat flows into your shape, just like a flowing stream has a whirlpool in it, and uh, it keeps the whirlpool there, but the whirlpool is never the same water. It goes on and on. So in just the same way, all these creatures are a kind of a tide of food. And it goes in and it does that creature and it flaps around and then it goes out again. So w what's all that about? Uh, in the Buddhist philosophy, that all that is called thusness. Uh, it's like that. Like, uh, did you ever see a lady go this way, go that way? And so a Buddha is called in Sanskrit a Tathagata, which means one who comes or goes thus. It's very simple. That's, the, that's what it's doing. And things are doing that. Only to make a, a kind of game of it, we put valuations on it. It's like poker. You get chips. How much are the chips worth? Well, they're worth anything you want to say they're worth. So in the same way, all this is going on, and you say, well, what is important? Is there something important here? Well, yes, we say, there are certain things that are more important than others. We, we've agreed among ourselves, because we are people, that we are more important than seagulls. And the seagulls have agreed among themselves <coughs> that they're more important than people. And uh, they, they recognize their kind, and they pick out in life, all the things that are significant to their needs as we pick out the things that are significant to our needs. We say, now, that's the thing that really must happen. But actually, nothing must happen. It just, it just happens. And that's called thusness or suchness. And so the Zen is concerned. The, 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 the uh, whole nature of Zen is to get you back to seeing the suchness of things. You, it's a process of unhypnotizing you. You see, when you, you hypnotize people by making them pay attention. You say, I want you to look very closely at my finger. I want you to relax completely and uh, pay attention only to this finger here. See? And uh, but there are many other ways of doing it. You, you, you hypnotize people much better by not letting them know that's what you're doing. And all showbiz and teaching and so on is hypnosis. Your parents began to hypnotize you the moment you were born because they told you what was important to look at. You know, a baby looks at everything. A baby is interested in just anything around. I mean, children sometimes point out things for which we have no words. They say, what's that? You say, what do you mean? <laughs> well, don't you see? That? Uh, well, look, it's perfectly clear. I'm that. What's, what's, the, what's, what's the word for that? You suddenly realize that they are pointing out a configuration of patterns on something that we don't have a word for. I mean, we, for example, we don't have a, a, a single word in English for dry space. We don't have a word for... Uh, 
most kinds of smell. For example, the smell of cheap perfume, uh, like Ben-Hur, or that sort of very metallic, uh, crude kind of perfume. We don't have any word that de describes that specific quality of smell. Because we, we haven't thought it significant very much to bother about our noses. But, ch but little children smell everything, they look into everything, they suck their toes, they explore their whole bodies, everything all around. And they're fascinated. But the adults say, no, no, don't touch this, do touch that, look at this, don't bother about that, because they're teaching them the human game and what is significant and what is not. Now, when you see you have picked out things in the world that are the important things, the significant things, in other words, the things, a thing is a name for something you think about. All things are units of thought, like an inch is a unit of measurement or an ounce is a unit of weight. A thing is a unit of thought. It's a think. And so when you say you can only think of one thing at a time, you can only think one thing at a time. That's what it's saying. Because actually, you say, think of a thing, think of the tape recorder. How many things is the tape recorder? You know, it's a mass of stuff. Uh, the human body, likewise. But when that, that predicament is foisted on you, and you have divided life into all these things, then you are under the delusion that the world is all separated and disjointed. And that you are only something in the world. You forget by doing that, that you are, that your physical organism, let me put it this way, is something that the whole cosmos is doing. The real you is all that there is. The whole works. There's no real separation. I mean, uh, when I say there are, there's no separation, don't imagine that I'm saying that uh, there aren't any skins, there aren't any outlines, there aren't any surfaces or lines. Yes, of course there are. But the, the basic lesson in metaphysics is that for every inside there is an outside. That's really all you need to know. Once you really understand that, you've mastered all philosophy. That the inside and the outside go together, in other words. People think that I'm in the inside and you're on the outside. But where would my inside be without the outside? See, imagine a bottle which has an inside but no outside. It won't work. There's no such thing. Imagine an object with no external space around it. It couldn't exist. So the space and the object go together, just in the same way as your front and your back go together. And that's it. Only, you see, we're taught by pointing out what things are important and what are not, to ignore that. So ignoring it is in Sanskrit ignorance, avidya, and the Buddhists say, Avidya is the beginning of the trouble. You just ignore how the inside and the outside go together. So, uh, the, 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 the work of Zen is to get people unhypnotized by this sort of thing back to the point where they started in babyhood but they never cultivated it because they were developed along other lines. To, it's called to regain one's original treasure that you received from your father and mother. Or what is sometimes called to get the unborn mind. That's a curious phrase, the mind that didn't arise. That is to say, what you are fundamentally as distinct from what you pop up and declare yourself to be. 
Imagine, for example, a big sow with many tits on it. All these are passages to a central source of milk. And so they unite together under the surface. Well, in the same sort of a way, you see, we are all uh, united like that. We are channels through which it is happening. Only, we are sensitive only on the tip of the nipple. <laughs> We're all our concentration is there at that point. And so we've lost the realization of being the whole thing. That happened very, very early in our infancy. Now, when you get it back, uh, you don't become incapacitated. In other words, it isn't as if you lost the sensation and the comprehension of what we call the different things and events in the world, their names, their places, all that sort of practical knowledge. The knowledge, in other words, that is helpful for survival. You don't lose that. But you see all these separate things and people and events in a new context. You might say against a new background in which you see that they're all one. Or if I'm going to get very, very technical, as the Indian logicians like to, he would say they are non-dual. Because the word one uh, is still a dual word. It has an opposite. One is opposed to many or to none. Whereas this whatever it is that we are all on doesn't have an opposite because it's everything. So the word one isn't quite the right word for it. So they use the word non-dual, which is a kind of a fancy word. They use it... I mean, non-dual is, of course, the opposite of dual. But they have a convention about it. Uh, imagine when you draw on a flat surface and you want to represent the third dimension of depth, you do it still using lines on the flat surface, but by a convention that we all agree on, certain slanting lines indicate this dimension. And we all know that. So in the same way in Indian philosophy, certain words are used to designate a dimension not in our ordinary way of thinking. Our ordinary way of thinking is either this or that. We think in dualities. And that may have something to do with the fact that our brain has two sides and we have two eyes, two ears, and so on, two nostrils. Uh, the, the, this and, and the way our ribs are formed, growing out of the spine, and two legs and two arms. And it, it, probably that structure is connected with the way we think. Either this or that. Will you have what's in the left hand or will you have what's in the right? And... So, we can't talk about, we can't say anything sensible about everything, about the universe. Because we can't find something that's not the universe, you see. So, then what we do is we take a dualistic word and say, uh, it is to be understood that this word refers to what is beyond all dualistic ideas. You see, look at it this way. In order to make a word mean something, I have to be able to say what is excluded from the meaning of this word. It's like a box. If the box is there, there must be what's inside the box and there must be what's outside the box. Now, I want to talk to you about a box which uh, is the ultimate box, the class of all classes, as logicians say. And uh, there isn't anything outside it. Everything is in this box. 
Well, a logician would say that's absurd. There could be no such box. It wouldn't be a box. Unless you can show me that it has an outside. I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to get clever with this fellow. I'm going to say, yeah, I, uh, my box has an outside. Uh, and the outside and the inside, however, go together. Actually, the box I have here is constructed in a peculiar way. You know what a Mobius strip is, don't you? You take a strip of paper, you twist it once, and you join the two ends to have a continuous strip. Now, this has a very strange property. It has only one side and only one edge. You can hold that strip of paper between your fingers and say, well, look here, I've got one finger on one side and one on the other. It obviously has two sides. I say, wait a minute. Take a pencil, a light, bright red pencil, and run it along that so-called one side that you think you have there, and keep going. And you will find, when you have followed the pencil back to the place where you started, that you never took it off the paper to go around to the other side. In the same way, you run your finger along one edge of it, and you keep running, and you'll get back to the point where you started from, and you will have covered the whole thing, both sides, both edges. Now, just put that now into three dimensions instead of two, and you have what's called a Klein bottle. If you, I think somewhere around the house, I'll dig it out, we have the Life magazine book on mathematics, and it has a beautiful drawing of a Klein bottle in it. That has the same property in three dimensions. Now imagine a world which has the same property in four dimensions. And you've got something like what our universe is. Its outside is the same as its inside. Crazy. And, uh, but you, you see, it's difficult to talk about that in the kind of language that we have. Just in the same way, uh, mathematicians, especially in, with mathematics applied in physics, have ideas which they can express in their formulae, but which they can't talk, uh, they can't tell the layman about it. Because in order to instruct the layman as to the meaning of these concepts, they have to put them into our ordinary three-dimensional sensory images, and they always distort it. So you see, the view, that's why it's said that uh, Zen cannot be explained in words. Although it is, in a way, explained very clearly in words, in all these little stories. Nevertheless, these stories are not intelligible until you have what I can only call a new dimension of consciousness. You see, a lot of people don't really have depth perception. They would look at the moon and see it as a disk. They don't see a ball. In the same way, a lot of people are tone deaf. They hear noises, but never hear tunes. It's something like that. <clears throat> Suddenly, one day, you say, good heavens, the, the moon's a ball. Or you suddenly become alive to what it is that people dig in music. Well, in just that sort of way, you can become suddenly alive <coughs> to the, I'll just call it, the oneness of everything that's going on. And you see that that's all you. And you are eternal. You're what there is. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Because uh, all we're, we're coming and going we go through a whole spectrum of feelings from the most rapturous pleasures to the most ghastly agonies. And it's all as insubstantial as weaving smoke. 
and just go, you know, just get with it and go. And then you have the basic understanding of Zen. Now, all that I've said thus far is simple introduction to what Zen is about. This, this way of understanding things arose independently in both India and China. In India, in what we call the tradition of the Upanishads, in Vedanta and Yoga and so on. Then in Buddhism. In China, in the form of Taoism. And they reached each other eventually. And the confluence of the Buddhist and the Taoist traditions came to be Zen. And this, the, the, the formation of Zen really began in about 415 AD in China with the students of a great Hindu monk, Kumarajiva. And uh, in the following 200 years, 300 years, it slowly took form and took form until a very remarkable man by the name of Huineng, H-U-I-N-E-N-G, who died in 713 A.D., was the man who put it on the map who, as it were, brought all the threads together and could be called the real founder of Chinese Zen. Now, we're going to, in the course of this seminar, we're going to look at the work of Huineng, but I want first, before we look at him, to look at some of the earlier people, especially Sung Tsan. Sung Tsan, uh, was a couple of generations before Huineng, spiritual generations, that is, master pupil, master pupil sort of thing, uh, who wrote the most succinct summary of Zen uh, that exists, which is called the Shin Shin Ming. That is to say, the treatise on trust in the mind mind with a capital M, which means many things. Mind is used in Zen. They use the word Shin, and when a Chinese says Shin, he points here. Kokoro in Japanese, the heart mind, the psychic center of gravity. But it means mind in a much wider sense than that. It means mind in the sense of, do you mind? Mind out. <laughs> uh, and it also means mind in the sense of uh, space. Everything that we see is on the mind. Like the sound of the radio is on the diaphragm of the loudspeaker. So it's a very wide sense of the word. Well, let's have an intermission now. This morning I simply tried to give you a general survey of what Zen is about by way of being an introduction. And I was discussing the peculiar reasons for the interest in Zen in the West, stressing the extraordinary way in which the sort of now you see it, now you don't implication of Zen literature has fired people's imagination and curiosity. That uh, the feeling there is a new vision of the world 
in the aspect of its unity as distinct from our ordinary vision of the world in the aspect of its multiplicity and broken upness, fallen apartness. And that this is something that you might somehow suddenly catch at any minute. It isn't that Zen is an easy thing or that it's a difficult thing. It might be either. And, uh, but it, it, it exercises this peculiar fascination by saying that the vision of the world in its unity is terribly obvious. It's right under your nose, only you're looking too hard in the wrong place so you don't see it. And so this is always the same puzzle as if I said to you, if you came here, you know, and said, well, we want some philosophical enlightenment or whatever, and I looked at you in a funny way and said, but you've forgotten something. You know, as if you hadn't got your pants on or something. Uh, what have you forgotten? You know? Uh, who do you think you are, anyhow? Well, you say, I'm, I'm, I'm just me. Oh, now, come on. Don't give me that line. Well, what do you mean? I'm just poor little me. Oh, nuts. <laughs> Don't put on that act. <laughs> and that, essentially, you see, it's that kind of upaya which a Zen teacher uses. Upaya is a Sanskrit word meaning uh, pedagogical techniques in spiritual disciplines. In politics, it means cunning, but in the vocabulary of Buddhism or Hinduism, it means the expert cunning used by a teacher to surprise and trick his students out of their egocentricity. And Zen, therefore, in all these koans, dialogues, rough zazen practices and so on. It's all upaya. It's a colossal hoax, but a very beneficent one. <laughs>True Zen came to birth in China as a result of a sort of interplay between Buddhism and Taoism. Now, Taoism is a kind of, uh, exists in a sort of contrapuntal relationship to Confucianism. Confucianism is the philosophy of social order, and it is a very uh, literary kind of attitude to life. Confucianism centers around the idea that sanity is grounded in words numbers, and ritual. You might say Confucianism is a social ritual rather than a religion. It's based on the idea that you've got to find the right names for things, and it's terribly important to name things properly. Exactness of language is, is critical. And so also music has to be just right. So Confucianism makes for a very high order of civilized, conventional living. Not, I might say in passing, without a certain humor. Their humor is all through the Chinese nature. Confucius was a profoundly humorous man, but in a very cool way. He didn't have Zhuangzi's belly laugh. But, uh, you see, basic to Confucianism is the idea of what is called Ren. This is Romanized J-E-N, but it's this character in Chinese.
and uh, it means human heartedness to be a reasonable person is the highest of all virtues and that really it means uh, the, it's, it's involves, for example, the ability to come off it, to avoid fanaticism, to accept the fact that all human beings are good, bad, that we all have in ourselves an element of the rascal, and that you should simply get along by recognizing that, so that if somebody picks a fight with you, you work out a compromise you realize that he picked a fight simply because he had emotions and he was human and he was greedy or whatever it is, and so are you. And so you work out a compromise. And uh, the Confucian would say that the human being as he is, both bad and good, is more trustworthy and reliable than a person who pretends that he's not like that. A person who pretends that he is good and moral, and in all things a model of integrity, is a very dangerous man. Confucius said, the goody-goodies are the thieves of virtue. So, Yan is the Confucian norm. But then they like to be, they live a very artificial style of life with a great deal of formality and good manners and propriety, and Confucians are rather much Puritans when it comes to sex. On the other hand, the Taoists represent the opposite pole. They make fun of all attempts to pin things down in words, because they say, with what words will you define the right words? And with what words will you define those? They know that a dictionary is circular. Have you ever played a game called Vish? Short for Vicious Circle. What you do is this. You uh, have a number of people sitting around a table, each one with, with a standard college dictionary. And there's a referee. And at the word go, uh, a certain word is given. And everybody looks up that word. Then they look up the key word in the definition of that word. And then they look up the key word in the definition of that word, and so on. When they get round to the start word again, they call out Vish. The person who calls out Vish first is the winner of the game. <laughs> uh, but the referee is to decide whether you played fair, you know, whether you really looked up a significant word in each clause. And you have to keep a, have a pad to keep a record of your steps, the words you looked up. So that if anyone challenges you, the referee can uh, judge. So Taoism is the force in Chinese culture which represents disillusion with the social game. You see, Lao Tzu himself, by legend, who is supposed to have lived around 600 BC to be a contemporary of Confucius, but probably lived rather later than that. Uh, he was supposed to be the court librarian and who became absolutely sick of the intrigue and the flattery and the insincerity of court life and decided to quit, and just go off by himself on a hike in the mountains. But he was stopped at the gate by the captain of the guard, who said, Sir, um, we can't let you go unless you first leave behind uh, a compendium of your wisdom. So he's supposed to have sat down in the, court, in the gatehouse and written the stanzas of the Tao Te Ching, uh, translated over 70 times into English alone. Uh, and then the guard let him go and he disappeared into the mountains. So the idea of, to put it very boldly, the idea of Confucianism is that all details of living 
should be done in a state of highly controlled consciousness and should be just so exactly right according to the rules. The counter idea of Taoism is that it's better to let everything happen by itself. Trust your impulses, trust your instincts, trust your natural urges, let go of it all. Now, these two ways of describing Confucianism and Taoism are exaggerated. I am caricaturing them for the sake of contrast. For example, a Taoist is not really a person who believes in pure laissez-faire. What he is trying to say, the, the, the principle in Taoism called Wu Wei, which means non-interference or non-aggression, non-assertion, he's saying don't act against the grain of things, act with it. Wu Wei is applied in Judo. Now Judo is, a, as you know, a highly effective form of interfering with things. But it does it on the principle of going with the grain. In other words, um, if in judo, there is, there is a form of judo, uh, which is called juno kata, and it's slow motion judo to demonstrate the principles. And in one of these uh, juno kata exercises, there is the, always the attacker and the defender. And the attacker begins by going at you like this, see? And this is the lead. Now, what does the defender do? Instead of hitting back at that lead, he does this. He takes the hand of the attacker and pulls it on like this. Then he catches the other hand and bends the fellow across him. He's caught him. Uh, in another one, the attacker does this. Going to the jaw. The defender catches this upswinging hand like this, carries it right on, twirls the fellow round, and locks his arm thus. The attacker is now bending backwards like this, but he's facing this way, and his right arm is thus caught. See, these are the formal exercises which demonstrate the principles. The principle of judo is overcoming nature by cooperating. Same way as a sailor tacks against the wind. So, you see, it isn't quite uh, not doing anything. It's, as we say, striking while the iron is hot, taking time by the forelock, etc., etc. There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. And that's Taoism. But Taoism does tend to be the attitude of skepticism towards the uh, social and commercial rat race. And says, really, do we have to play that game? Uh, wouldn't you actually be better off living in a kind of dignified poverty? And uh, so you see, in a way, Taoism is a philosophy for old people. After you've sowed your wild oats and you've uh, made something in life and had children and so on, and you become an old gentleman, well, that's enough of that. And so you ask the question, now, behind this facade I put on, this role I've been playing and pretending that I'm someone, who am I really? And what is all this thing about? So the Taoist is a kind of a mountain man. He goes to the mountains. And you know that lovely Chinese poem? It's called um, Seeking the Hermit. I asked the boy beneath the pines, and he says the master's gone alone, herb gathering somewhere on the mount, cloud hidden, Whereabouts unknown. And so there's this notion, you know, of the old man, mysterious old man, somewhere up there on Mount Tamalpais, and those trails hidden by the mist. 
and the Taoists really dig that. And that's landscape paintings of the Chinese, of the old masters uh, sitting uh, on craggy canyons, drinking sake or whatever, plum wine or whatever they have. Uh, that's their idea of the good life. Now, both the Confucians and the Taoists on, uh, although there's a certain Puritanism in Confucian uh, ethics, they all believe in the physical world uh, as a good thing. The Taoist loves nature, the Confucian is particular about parents and family and all that jazz. The Buddhists of India, on the other hand, tended very often to be anti-physical. I mean, in other words, to be celibate, to be uh, interested in getting out of this state of consciousness in which the world appears to us in its multiplicity. The Chinese never could get on with that. They didn't see any sense in that Indian attitude. So when Buddhism came to China, the Chinese did a flip with it. And they wanted a kind of Buddhism which, although it was sort of monastic in the Indian tradition, was not monastic in the way that it is in India or in Burma, Ceylon. Buddhism for the Chinese is to some extent a thing which you go into for a time and you attain enlightenment and then you can come back, as it were, and do anything you want. You can have family, you can uh, be a tramp, you can just play it uh, any way. But you, or they feel, with, in, in, with the whole tone of the Mahayana uh, type of Buddhism, even in India, is that once enlightened, you ought to come back. So the situation of a Buddhist monk in the Far East is, generally speaking, that he's not quite like a monk as we understand monks in the West. Monks in the West take life vows. They vow poverty, chastity, and obedience until they die. But in the Far East, a Buddhist monk may uh, go into the discipline for a number of years and then return to lay life with no bad feelings. In fact, he may be considered a considerable success in having done so. So, that kind of trend in the Confucian and the Taoist attitudes, when it coalesces with Indian Buddhism, produces something very different from anything you'll find in India. And Zen, uniquely and outstandingly, represents this sort of attitude. So, too, when these uh, Indian monks worked with their Chinese opposites, the scholars, to translate the Buddhist Sanskrit texts into Chinese. It was obvious that they would find equivalent words from the vocabulary of Taoism. So, for example, when any Chinese master is addressing his students, the phrase which he's liable to use uh, in saying students he says, Dao Liu. Dao Liu means, uh, we translate it, O you followers of the way, of the Dao, the way of nature. But the Buddhist marga, the path, the noble eightfold path, the road, the path, finds the Chinese equivalent in Dao. But Dao means far more than Marga. 
Dao has overtones which the word marga doesn't have in Sanskrit. Marga is simply something like a method, a, a course of discipline, a set of stages. But Dao means the fundamental way of the world, what is innate, so that if you can find out what is innate in you to do or to be and follow that, you are following the Tao. You are not following any laid down set of rules, but marga in Sanskrit means a set of rules. So you see what happens? Now furthermore, say Tao Liu is to say the character Liu, which is follower, actually means flow. So you get feng liu, which means the flow of the wind, and thus has come to mean elegance of a certain kind. See, supposing somebody is sitting by the stream, like here, on a misty evening, and a bird is calling in the distance, and he's sitting there fishing. But he's not fishing just to catch fish. He's not just a peasant who needs fish. He's a poet who doesn't care whether he catches a fish or not. He just loves to be there and dig that scene. That's Feng Liu. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that, that means uh, everything. Uh, the the, the uh, Feng, uh, which means ordinarily wind, also means atmosphere in the sense that we, you say, a, a place or a room has a certain atmosphere. That restaurant has atmosphere, fun. Uh, there's also uh, um, feng shi. What's the Chinese word? The Japanese would say um, fushu. Um, the atmosphere of our school. In other words, the, uh, the Zen school has a certain flavor to it, which you recognize in the way a man walks or his style. Uh, so it's uh, enlightenment experience. It's Satori. has a certain style to it that is different from other people's enlightenment, although they're all equally enlightenment. So Liu the feng liu is the flow. So when you translate from Sanskrit, follower of the path, and you come out with do liu, or dao liu, Japanese say do liu, uh, you get an entirely different meaning. Somebody who flows with the Tao. So a Zen monk is called in Chinese, Yun Sui, cloud water man. Yun, cloud, sway water. Because he drifts like a cloud, he has no attachments, you see, and he flows like water. Uh, he may be called uh, in uh, Sanskrit uh, one who has entered the stream. That's the technical meaning for somebody who's started on the way of Buddhism. He has entered the stream. But this doesn't have the same quality of meaning as Yun Sui. He has entered the stream in the sense that he is crossing the stream from this shore to the other shore. But Yun Sui means he's going with the stream. If you've read that marvelous book of Hermann Hesse called Siddhartha, where uh, he ends up with the enlightenment of his hero by watching a river and, get, and learning from the river, you know exactly what the Taoist means by flowing with the Tao. Because he sees, of course, the river is simultaneously at its source and at its goal, and that all the forms in it are... Uh, forms of the whole river, and at the same time, uh, there's nothing individual about them. Well, I mean, they're, they're, each form is individual, but at the same time, 
it isn't a lump of water. You know, a wave isn't a lump of water. It's water passing constantly, flowing through the wave. The wave stays there, but the water flows through, see? So that's what he learned from the stream. So you see how the Chinese language, when you turn Sanskrit words into it, the Chinese language with the background of meaning that these words have acquired from Taoist philosophy made a complete change in the nature of Buddhism. Also, uh, there's another thing to it. The Chinese uh, called a bluff on a lot of Indian uh, nonsense. I have to explain this by telling a sort of a modern anecdote. Joseph Campbell, who is, as you know, the editor of all the works of Heinrich Zimmer, and actually wrote them himself out of Zimmer's notes, went to India, and he went to the greatest living guru in India today, who is an ex-policeman, and uh, said to him, uh, the sutras say uh, that all things are Brahman. Isn't this also true of the illusion, of the, of the maya? Isn't that the, f the way, you know, we feel every day and uh, just ordinary kind of human beings, isn't that the Brahman too? And this man said, you know, it's interesting, that was the first question I asked my teacher. He said, of course they are. Well, Joe said, nobody in India teaches that anymore. So uh, the guru took Joseph downstairs to all his students and said, I want you to meet a great rishi sage from America. <laughs> uh, he, he really has found it. And uh, you should, uh, he will get, now give you a lecture or something. I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> in other words, the Hindu tends to say, Yes, in fact, all this world that you see now before your eyes is the divine, ultimate, non-dual reality. But of course, you have to find out that it is. And when you do, it will disappear. You will go into what they call nirvikalpa samadhi. That means, technically, it means being in a state of samadhi without having concepts. But they mean something else by it. They mean as if all the shapes that you saw before you were suddenly to dim out. And instead there is nothing but light. You see? Maybe this is light is slightly violet. But I don't know. Anyway, that every kind of sensual, sensual experience disappears. Now then, uh, the, the way in which you, you have to argue this with a Hindu Swami who takes this line is to say, but your position is still dualistic because you've moved from the vision of form to the formless vision. This is, this is just changing places. This is not liberation. It's somewhere else on the wheel. <coughs> and you know they have to admit it. And I once had an argument with a Swami in which I brought up a point we were discussing this morning. He was referring to the Brahman, the ultimate reality, as the one. That's oneness as distinct from multiplicity. I said, uh, 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 uh. Oneness has an opposite. And the Brahman has no opposite. And what do you think he said? He said, you argue just like a Hindu. 
<laughs> well, he knew very well. I mean, he was using loose language, and uh, as we all do. So this this was the thing you see historically in the development of Indian philosophy that took place between about. 100 and 400 AD, that they faced the fact that looking for a state of consciousness that's radically different from this state now is just an escape. It hasn't really come to terms with the problem. The problem is, you see, that the state of consciousness you're in now, however last up it may be, is in Hindu language the play of Vishnu. You are all Vishnu playing that you're in this mess, which is the part of the cosmic dance. So, if that's the case, dig it. You see, I mean, get with it. Uh, be that. So the Chinese caught on to this. And uh, when you could say, uh, This very moment, this very world, this very body is the point now. And if, but if you see you're seeking something beyond all the time, you never get with it. You're never here. So they saw, they saw that very clearly. So uh, this man, Sung San, who I was talking about at the end of this morning's session, who um, is one of the first... I would say, really articulate people about Zen, who wrote the Xin Xin Ming. He starts out by saying, the great Tao, or the perfect Tao, is without difficulty, except that it avoids picking and choosing. Only when you neither love nor hate does it appear in all clarity. A hair's breadth of deviation from it and a deep gulf is set between heaven and earth. If you want to get hold of what it looks like, do not be anti or pro anything. The conflict of longing and loathing, this is the disease of the mind. Okay, now, uh, if you take that quite literally, if you try to avoid picking and choosing, that's another kind of choice, isn't it? If you say, I ought not to love anything, I ought not to hate anything, I ought not to take any extreme attitudes, you're still choosing. If I say, uh, in psychological jargon, uh, for psychiatric health, you ought to accept yourself. You know? Accept everything that happens. Well, among the things that happen is the very concrete fact that there are things you don't accept and that you can't accept. So you have to accept that. Now do you see what this does? It's a very interesting technique. <laughs> it's saying that you are, each one, a Buddha, enlightened, even before you've accepted yourself. You see, you don't have to do anything about it. But it's terribly difficult for human beings to resist the temptation to do something about it. So it says, OK, do that. If you want to practice yoga and meditation, go ahead. If you feel that would make you better, do it. 
But the point is that there's, no, there's really nothing to do, or there's nothing not to do either. You won't get this by sort of acting spontaneous in a phony way, but you can do that if you want to too. But you're it right where you stand without making a single move. And that's what's meant, you see, profoundly by avoiding picking and choosing. Actually, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You may get the illusion that your picking and choosing makes a real difference, that your choices really do change the nature of things, but they don't. And so, uh, so long as you want to hang on to that illusion and play it, there you are. But actually, you are, as you live and all sit around this room at the moment, in the various stages of what you may consider subjectively to be goodness and badness, sickness and health, uh, sanity and insanity, e every one of you is as much a, a splendid accomplishment as the shape of the clouds, and just as natural. You know, with all the funny hairdos and artificiality and everything, we're all like the birds. Only we have a complicated way of pretending that we aren't, so that we figure out we're something special. And that's it too, you see. But it's, it is a tough job getting anybody to see that. So what do they do? They have all these techniques, and uh, they put you through the mill, because people won't accept this vision until they feel they've paid for it. Until they feel, they, they, they finally discover after enormous effort, like the student I told you about this morning, there isn't anything to realize. It really is fantastic. See, so all, all this is very direct and simple. So not picking and choosing doesn't mean that you have to uh, cultivate being detached. You can try that, sure. But then you find you're terribly attached to your non-attachment. Like you're proud of your humility or something like that. Uh, it just goes round and round and round. So, you know, come unstuck. <laughs> well, you always were unstuck because you're in the flow. And nothing is stuck. It all is changing, changing, changing. One is nothing but a flow of change. There isn't anything to hang on to, and nobody to hang on to it. You know, here is a decaying hand grasping at smoke. It's all falling apart, and there's nothing anybody can do about it, because what anybody is who perhaps could do something about it, that is falling apart too. That's what's meant by the doctrine of anatman. There is no, uh, the Buddhist idea that there is no permanent self because it's all falling apart. <laughs> so, cheer up, you know, it's, it's great. <laughs> so, uh, Not knowing the profound meaning of things, we disturb our original peace of mind to no purpose. Original peace of mind is um, what I was referring to as the child's, in the infant's, the baby's fundamental knowledge of uh, the unity of the world, the oceanic feeling that Freud calls it. Perfect like great space, the Tao lacks nothing and has nothing in excess. Truly, because of our accepting and rejecting, we don't get the suchness of things. You see, uh, I, I explained suchness this morning, how it's uh, the way Everything is just, is just like that. And, but we pick out some things as significant and other things as not significant. 
And uh, this prevents us from seeing that all the insignificant things are in a way significant, and all the significant things are in a way insignificant. See, that I go on living is, for me, significant. Until I don't anymore. But that means I'm going to run around, busy, 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 talk a lot, and work, and eat, and entertain, and do this, that, and the other, and uh, it's, a, it's a great dance. Actually, uh, it has no more ultimate meaning than uh, somebody sitting and going... <laughs> One Zen master said, from the bathtub to the bathtub, I have uttered stuff and nonsense. <laughs> that was his death verse. The bathtub in which the baby is washed at birth, the bathtub in which the corpse is washed before burial. All the time he's been talking nonsense. And so all these birds are going around, you know, and all these human beings are going, making this great hullabaloo and building houses and all that kind of thing. And it's all, uh, well, it's just suchness. That's the point. <laughs> so, neither follow after nor dwell with the doctrine of the void. I mean, don't get hooked on the idea that things are empty and therefore that this is a way of saying that the world is a ghastly sham and something you ought to avoid. That's what this means. Uh, so don't try to catch hold of this doctrine as if it would do you some good. And on the other hand, don't uh, dwell with it. Don't get attached to it. For if the mind is at peace, these wrong views disappear of themselves. The mind at peace is um, not quite what we ordinarily mean by peace of mind. Oh, he quotes a thing here on the comment, neither follow after nor dwell with the doctrine of the void. This verse, 